The church is a spiritual community formed by God from those who love Jesus and belong to him. That was the idea we began exploring last week. And we're going to move on and explore each of the components to that statement one by one, seeing how they come from Scripture. It's not a complete description. It's not a sufficient description as if it covers all of the bases, all of the understanding, the richness of what the church is in the New Testament and, and in the Old as well as we look forward to the church coming. But it's a great place for us to start. And we're going to see that it does come from Scripture. We looked last week at the community idea, that we belong to one another, that, that we are called together. The New Testament actually uses organic language sometimes, that we are an organism the church, the body of Christ, functioning each part necessary and arranged just as God has desired and designed it to be. We're going to move on next to what does it mean to call us a spiritual community? What does it mean to say that the church is a spiritual community? And that's an idea we need to explore well because the idea of spirituality, what it means to say something is spiritual today, 21st century North America, it's a bit of an ambiguous concept. In fact, the idea, what it means to be spiritual has changed quite a bit in our cultural understanding. So to begin that exploration, I turn to the book of Joel. And we're going to look at Joel chapter 2, where God promises to pour out his spirit. We're going to use that as the touch point, as the starting point, and actually the, the foundation of what God is planning to do throughout the Old Covenant. God is looking forward to what he's going to do through Jesus in the church. We're going to see the Spirit of God at work in the Old Testament as a foundation for our understanding of what spirituality is. I don't do this very often, but as I was preparing that message and bringing it together and putting the finishing touches on the message, I began to hear and have conversations with people. A heartache, a longing, uh, a sense of challenge and difficulty within our church family, within my own home as Melody and I walked and talked together, within my own heart as I struggled this week. And I struggled this week with a few different challenges. The battle for my soul was raging this week. I recognize that right now within our church family, there is a lot of difficulty and struggle and trial. This lockdown has taken its toll on us. And now with the news coming this week that the lockdown is going to be extended beyond the original uh, end date here in May, probably into the, well, it will be into this next month, into June. I think people's hearts are heavy. One of the things that this spiritual community that God is forming out of those who love Jesus and who are called to him, what God is doing in the church, what he calls us to do is to pray for and with one another. And I felt a burden to do that together today. We're going to set aside that conversation about what the spiritual community looks like, what it means to call us a spiritual community, and in particular focusing in on the Old Testament first and then moving to Jesus and Paul and the other apostles. We're going to set it aside. And interestingly, I think Joel is going to set the framework. He's going to sort of set the tone for us. We're going to then turn to 2 Corinthians, and we're going to pray together. We're going to pray through a passage of Scripture together. Because I think right now, this is what we need as a church family. In general, I like to stick to the plan. I believe that God has, by his spirit, ordained certain things. He brings things into, into to fall just in place as they ought to be. And our planning is part of God's uh, providence in that. And so generally, I like to stick to the plan for this week, though. I think it's important we stop and we pause and we see that the spirit is moving and that there is a need for prayer and encouragement within our church family and beyond if you're not one of our Faith Baptist family and you're watching this video, I pray this is an encouragement for you as well. But let's begin by turning to the book of Joel. If you know anything about Joel, I find it a fascinating book, partly because Joel does not give a lot of specifics about the exact historical context of when he's writing. There are a few clues and cues in the book of Joel. We know certainly that there is an invasion of locusts, which, I mean, can't have happened that often. He certainly speaks about it as if it were an extraordinary event. But listen to what Joel writes, and I want you to hear the parallel or hear the touch point that we may have with Joel in his context. Because as we stand in COVID-19, it's a difficult time. It's a time of trial and testing, even perhaps judgment. I'm not standing up here as a prophet saying what God was doing in the book of Joel and through the prophet Joel I'm trying to do today, but 
what i'm saying is listen to the words and hear its echoes as it reaches down to us through the century joel chapter one beginning in verse two hear this you elders listen all you who live in the land has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has eaten, the great locusts have, sorry, what the great, what the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locust has left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of your new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it away, leaving the branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. I know we have not seen an invasion of locusts, but our world has been changed by this virus. COVID-19 has shifted for an entire generation our perspective our way of life. Has anything like this ever happened in all your days? Joel used, and God through the prophet Joel, used this invasion of locusts to teach the people about the coming judgment. They were asked to see in their own moment what God had in store for the future. And he used that as a call to repentance, a call to return to him. In fact, in Joel chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, God says, On Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the survivors, whom the Lord God was bringing deliverance from his holy hill. He said in the verse just previous, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God was using the calamity, the disaster, the invading army of locusts of Joel's day to call the people to look forward and look heavenward and seek refuge in him. That is what we need right now. Regardless of what you are struggling with, we need to turn to God and find something worth holding on to. We need to turn to his holy hill and seek salvation because he has promised to save those who put their trust in him. So we're going to pray together today. We're going to consider the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. We're going to read through them, we're going to explore them a little bit, and then we're going to pray them together. We're going to use this passage of Scripture as the foundation and the guide for our prayer. Paul writes, But we have this treasure, when he speaks of the treasure, he's speaking about the gospel, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That was what just came previously in verse 6. It's that treasure, this good news of Jesus Christ, the glory of Jesus the glory of God seen through Jesus. That's the treasure we have. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. 
For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Let's just explore that very quickly. Notice Paul uses the image of a clay vessel, an earthenware vessel, to house a glorious treasure. And there's a parallel there. There's a comparison. A clay pot was a relatively cheap item in Paul's world. When it breaks, you don't repair it. You throw it away. You buy a new one. But what it contains is a glorious treasure. And Paul says this treasure has been invested in us. We are earthen vessels, but we carry with us. We carry within us the glory of God, because we belong to Jesus, because he has set us free, because his spirit lives in us. You want to read more about that? Read the beginning, the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Paul will explore that glory that we have received and that is actually changing us. But Paul says we have this treasure in these earthen vessels, these jars of clay, and we have glory in a very shabby container so that the container never thinks it's about us. We realize where the glory comes from. This is to show that the power is from God and not from us. Paul goes on to say we are hard pressed on every side. And to me, this resonates with where we are right now. He says we are pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. He says, we are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. He says these things, recognizing that because Jesus lives, the end of our story, no matter what happens to us throughout the pages of that story, no matter how bad things get, the story is always trending and tending towards a glorious return of our king and the restoration of us. Our new birth will be realized in full. So no matter what you are put through here and now, it is merely the gateway, it is merely the the passageway to what is coming next. Paul says elsewhere in in 2 Corinthians here that these light and momentary afflictions are earning for us, are gaining for us a glory that surpasses them all. And so what we find today is that we are pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in us the body of the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. Do you believe that Jesus is alive? We just came through the Easter season and we were reminded of the fact that because Jesus lives, everything has changed for us. In these difficult days, that is the perspective we need. That is the point of reference we need. Jesus is alive. Do you believe that? If you believe that, what you are going through right now, your perspective on that trial, that struggle, that difficulty will be changed. Because even if it kills you, death will not have the final word. Jesus is alive, so too we will live. Even if we lose all we have in this world, there is an inheritance waiting for us that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Even if everyone abandons us, your friends, your family, your community, there is one who has promised he will never leave you or forsake you. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in us. He reiterates with sort of a parallel. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. Do you understand that what you are going through right now, God has not only allowed it, but he has purposed it for your good. That because you have been through this trial, because we have gone through these things, we know that God is planning something fantastic. That is a faith you need to hold on to. 
That is a faith you need to pray, God, give me strength to believe that. Because I promise you, if you continue to believe that Jesus is doing something through your trial, through your pain, when you come out on the other side, you'll be ready to sing his praises. That there will be another side, that you will come through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You don't live in the valley of the shadow of death. You pass through the valley of the shadow of death, and the shepherd goes with you. And when you get to the other side, the pastures are green, the waters are quiet, and your soul is restored. And then finally, Paul finishes this little section here by saying, so then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Do you understand that? People are watching you. The world is bearing witness, or we are bearing witness to the world as the world witnesses what we are going through. And they are either seeing faithfulness or faithlessness. What a tragedy it is when the church does not live up to the faith to which we've been called. When we do not live worthy of the calling we have received. When we abandon our hope in Jesus and instead begin to despair like our neighbors. Instead begin to, to, to rail and to fight and to criticize and to slander. That is not worthy of the faith to which we have been called. However, when we believe with our hearts that Jesus is alive, that the same spirit who raised him from the dead is now in us, giving us the strength to stand regardless of what goes on around us. When we are faithful and God makes us faithful by his grace, the world can see, and even though death is at work in us, life begins to work in those who are witnessing the power of Christ in these jars of clay. Paul says, I will gladly endure death in my body, death at work in me, if it means that life may begin its work in you. Let's now turn and pray this passage together. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And Lord, that is my prayer to begin. That we would recognize your glory and our frailty. So much of my trouble comes because I think I am strong enough and good enough to stand on my own two feet. And Lord, you have given me strength. There have been times where you've given me skill and courage. There are times where you do ask me to stand up and fight hard with everything I have, to expend all of the energy that's in my flesh and bones. I thank you that I have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet, I am still but dust. I am still merely flesh. And my glory is like that of the grass of the field. It withers and fails and is eventually cast back into the flame, fuel for the fire. But you, O God, you who were before the beginning of creation, you who are the one who spoke into being all that is, your glory cannot be compared to anyone else. Jesus, the beauty of your love for us surpasses anything I can imagine. You who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Lord, I pray that I would never lose sight of the fact that I am just an earthen vessel, but there is one who wants to pour into me the glorious riches of his grace. Let me never forget that gospel story. The story of a doctor who came to heal the sick. A champion who came to set free his people held captive. A lamb who came to give his life up. 
to be the atoning sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. Jesus, thank you for the beautiful, glorious message of the gospel. I thank you that we have this treasure. And I thank you that my salvation does not rest on my strength or my skill, my intelligence, or even my will to believe, but rather on the inexhaustible riches of Jesus. It is that which saves me. You, Jesus, who cannot fail, have taken hold of me. And yes, I hold on, but I am held. And nothing can pluck me from the Father's hand. I thank you for this glorious treasure. Lord, we recognize that we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And my prayer today is for those who are being crushed, or for those who are being pressed. May they know that in you they can never be crushed. They may feel like they are being crushed, but the truth of the gospel is we will never be ground down to the point where we are lost because Jesus can even call the dead out from the graves. Lazarus, who is considered beyond hope, in the grave for four days, you spoke and he came out. Lord, I pray for those right now who feel pressed on every side. Because you live, Jesus, we will not be crushed. I pray for those who are perplexed right now. We do not know what to do, where to go, what risks to take. Pray, Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom because we are perplexed. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom and grace so that we would not despair. That even in our foolishness, Lord, you are working out something marvelous. May we just give to you. May we ask from you these situations and the wisdom to walk through them. Lord, give us the boldness to move forward with grace. Let us not be held captive by fear. And Lord, there is real danger of that, that we will be so afraid to do so afraid to speak, so afraid to stand up, so afraid to release, Lord. Sometimes that is the hardest thing, the most terrifying thing to do, is to give up control. Lord, I pray we would be not dominated by fear, but by hope. By the love, the perfect love that drives out fear, knowing that we belong to you. And so I pray for those who are perplexed today, that we would not find despair. We would not fall into despair, but hope. Lord, I pray for the persecuted. In many ways, the church where I live is increasingly seeing persecution, but in truth, we have a remarkable freedom. I recognize that's not true of everyone around the world. I recognize there are Christians right now who are being sorely persecuted. I pray for them, Lord. Lord, that persecution comes because we belong to you and the world hates us. As it hated you, it will hate us. We are not abandoned even when we are persecuted. Lord, I recognize that we live right now here in this world as strangers, yet our king is coming. Lord, keep our eyes on that truth. Help us remember that our king is near he is coming. And Lord, we pray, Maranatha, come quickly, Jesus. We long to see our king and be set free. See his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That is our prayer, Lord. And I pray for the persecuted that they will continue to have faith. And for those, Lord, who are struck down, and we recognize that there are those who are physically ill, who are emotionally just just feels like we've been struck down. Our minds and our hearts are being beaten and assaulted. For many of us, our bodies are being worn and they are under attack by virus. They are under attack by disease. They are under attack by infirmity. Lord, we recognize that we cannot be destroyed because we have received a promise that when this earthly tent is cast off, when this body is discarded, 
as a thing of this old creation. We are receiving, we have a hope in a new creation. And so we cannot be destroyed. We are beings of eternity and we are meant for something higher and greater, that coming kingdom when the sons and daughters of the king will be revealed. We know that all creation is groaning for that. Lord, I pray you'd give us the faith to believe that we will not be destroyed as long as we belong to you. We will not be destroyed. Lord, Paul writes that we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in us. God, whatever your purposes in this COVID-19 pandemic are, I don't understand them. Lord, when this first began, I heard people all around me praying, God, save us from this. Lord, protect us from this. Lord, you have the power to remove it. And I don't understand why you didn't do that. And part of my frustration, honestly, God, is why are you asking this of us? I don't understand. And maybe, Lord, you don't mean for me to understand. But I do know this, that for those who love you, for those who have been called according to your purpose, God, you work everything out for our good. In all these things, you work for our good. And so, Lord, as we think about this death that we carry around with us, Jesus, you faced trial and hardship. This death we carry with us is bringing out the life of Jesus in us as well. You, God, have a purpose in these things. I pray that even though I don't understand, I will have the faith to believe and trust you are doing something glorious. For my brothers and sisters who have lost sight of that, who have lost their sense of hope, and wonder how can God possibly work. Lord, I pray you'd restore the hope to those hearts. I pray you'd help them see that you are bringing life even in the middle of death. And finally, Lord, as Paul continues, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then death is at work in us, but life in, we're at work in you. Lord, I pray the world would see the church and we would be faithful witnesses of what we have received. The hope of the gospel, God, use COVID-19 to bring people to you. Help them see the, the emptiness and the vanity of what we have built these little castles on in our world. God, I am guilty of that. I have loved things that were unworthy. This week, I can think of the times, as I go back through my week, I can think of those occasions when I have loved unworthy things. I have worshipped at the seat of idols. I have stood before them and said, I love you. And that was wholly unworthy. And I am so grateful for the truth that as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Lord, as a church, I pray that we would confess where we have failed so that we may be restored, we may be cleansed, and the world will know that you are God because they see you working out your life in us. I pray we'd be faithful witnesses that as we see people hopeless and despairing, as we see people struggling, we would share the good news that Jesus is alive. Lord, I pray that the death at work in us would become life at work in others. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity to pray for one another. May we be faithful in this charge as your community, which has been called by your grace. We love you, Jesus, and we know that we belong to you. Come quickly, our King and our Lord. It is by your Spirit and in your name we pray.